Hey, welcome back to Driven Channel, and I'm very excited here with uh, one of my. Uh, you, you know, we're we have a similar background, and and uh, right. I I like uh, it makes me very proud when I have another Latino. You know that that is taking care of his family, that is working hard. I know that uh, you've had ups and downs like everybody else, so I'm I'm very excited to find out how you started. Um, I I know you have a, a huge vision right now for uh, an event and that you're that you're creating and. And you plan on an exit pretty soon, and you're working very hard for that. I know how much you love your daughter. Mm -hmm. and I, met, I met her a lot of times. She's yeah. probably watching the live. <laughs> but um, yeah. and I know when I met you on, on the on, on the internet on social media, yeah. your your uh, handle was Paquito. Yep, Paquito. So that's that's how I met Paquito. Um, but uh, Frank. Yeah. So I know people can follow you at Frank Funds Assets. Let's talk about that really quick to get started. Why 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 Frank Funds? assets like like what 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 does that mean to you yeah, yeah. and and tell us tell us your story how you got started in this space yeah so so frank is the name i i i came into when i got to this country right i got here we got here when i was five years old mom brought us smuggled us in but they called you paco no in paco, mexico na, in mexico my fam my my family calls me paquito paquito so it's very endearing so it's kind of cool so when you, you cross the border it changed to frank yeah because it in school, it was like Francisco, right? My teacher was like, can we just call you Frank? Yeah. So I said, all right, you know, call me Frank. And that has been sort of my professional name, mm -hmm. my educational name. Yeah. And then at home, my mom calls me Paco. Yeah. My family calls me Paquito sometimes, yeah. right? Endear endearing thing. Um, yeah, we got here when I was five. My single mom fled Mexico. Economic opportunity. I still believe that this is the land of opportunity, mm -hmm. no matter what people say. That's why all these immigrants were trying to get in. Yeah. Uh, when we got here, obviously, the, the story was we got here in the 90s. In the 90s, California was not a sanctuary for immigrants, mm -hmm. especially if you're undocumented. We had Pete Wilson, mm -hmm. right? Proposition I, I, I 187. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, probably yeah. remember yeah. that. Uh -huh. So it got pretty heavy with the propaganda, like immigrants are taking jobs, they're killing people, right? A lot of that rhetoric. Uh, my mom's freaked out for a little bit and kept us away from school. I don't know how long, so we were away from school. So it was a lot of fear back then. Um, things started to change. Um, I was a terrible student back then. Elementary school almost got expelled. Uh, I think I was acting up, right? A acting up to the system. The system was treating us like shit, so then I was, I was bullying. Are you talking about like elementary school or middle elementary school? school? Elementary school, elementary school. Where'd you go to school? Uh, Riverside, California. I, I was raised there. Was, was, was there a lot of uh, Latinos in the school? Yeah, there was a lot of Latinos, blacks, and we had a, mm. a white population too. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like racial stuff that would happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it was not until middle school, which is funny, that a professor of mine from Ireland kind of resonated with me. He's like, look, I'm a, I was an immigrant too and we were growing up. And I don't know what, what happened. I think he saw me crying one time because we had some domestic violence stuff at home because my yeah. mom had hooked up with someone. He said, found me crying and I told him a little bit what was going on and he shared his story. And, and just kind of like I resonated with you and your story, I resonated with this professor. And I went from a, a, an F student, almost getting expelled, to an A plus student. Because I was like, oh, this is, a, this is a track I could do. I could do really well in school. So I started doing really well in school. I got really competitive, um, went through high school. And then when I got to high school, I realized, shit, I don't have papers. I don't know how I'm going to go to school because back then, if you were undocumented, you, you couldn't go. Did you know the whole time you didn't have papers? Yeah. Yeah. It was it was obvious because my mom would always tell us like my mom got deported twice when we were little kids. So when she was away, we knew that she was away because she got caught. It she happened got, twice. It how, happened old, twi how old were you when when it happened the first time? Uh, I think um, probably like eight years old. Wow. Yeah. And then so we had some neighbors and some friends that took care of us. Were you close to her? Yeah, yeah, because I'm the oldest one, so that's like that's like my I daughter, like, right like my daughter. That's like your daughter. Your daughter, your daughter's how she's old? Ten. She's ten. Yeah. Well, I, you you see how attached she is to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like same thing with Italia. Yeah. So this, I mean, they're pretty damn close in 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 age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Could, like eight, like you were eight. It went, uh, your daughter's ten. My daughter's gonna be eight. Mm -hmm, so, I, I mean, imagine today if if that happened. Yeah. How would your daughter feel like if you get kicked out and you can't come back? Like, so when that happened, yeah. how long were you without your mom? Uh, how long did it take her to get back? It took her, it took her f several months. So it wasn't yeah. a whole year. So you were, you were, who was taking care of you? 
uh, we had some really good neighbor friends. It was, you know, I think. Because your dad wasn't there, right? It was. No, my, I never met my biological father. Uh, when we left Mexico, there was another guy my mom was with. That was not my biological father. And then out here, we did have a stepfather for a little bit. Mm -hmm. He'd like to drink and he was just not, not in the best of shape himself. Um, so, yeah, for, for a few months, there was a time. And also, my mom was away several times. She also got. This is crazy, right? This is where I, I kind of link it back. Malcolm X had his mom in a mental asylum. My mom, because of all this crap, right? Immigration, finances, my mom lost it. And she was in a mental asylum for, it felt like a year. She was gone for a long time, longer than when she got deported. So this was, this was nuts, right? Um, but that forced you, right, as the oldest, just to mature up. I remember realizing- You were the oldest? Yeah, the oldest and two boys, two other boys. So when, when that happened, you had other, uh, you had other brothers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old were they? So from Mexico, the other one that came, I'm two years older. So if I was 10, he was eight. And then there was a, my youngest was born here. There's like a seven year difference. But they were at the house when this happened? Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, you're taking care of both of them when yeah. your mom gets deported the yeah. first time. And how old are they? One six, you said? And yeah. One's yeah, so one of them is eight when I was 10. And the other one was like three years old. Yeah. So but this is this is when she got deported the first time When she got deported the first time. Yeah. And so anyway, there was a lot of that, you know, instability and not knowing where the hell was going on sometimes. But, but how was how were these two months, though? Like walk us through the two months. Yeah. You know what? Because you know what? You know what yeah. I think? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, people are watching this, right? Mm -hmm. And now today mm -hmm. it's crazy how weak people are. Mm -hmm like so weak and people complain about life work their feelings their life and 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 they have it easy you know like it's yeah. they, they have it you were if you were born here in your middle class even broke like you, you there's so many things you could do like you could go and and get some credit cards you could uh go to seminars you could uh learn things online mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you could start a, an easy small even a small business or you, or you could just open up an online store i mean there's so many things you could do you, you, <laughs> uh, you yeah. they, they print money here yeah. so if you're not making it and you're here you speak english you were born here you you you're like and then you're complaining about work life feelings uh, it, and you, you don't do anything with your life it just shows you how weak people have become because mm -hmm. like you're talking about like your childhood. Mm -hmm. I had my own childhood, you know, but, but I think that because you went through that, mm -hmm. you uh, developed thick skin mm -hmm. where it, it helped you become uh, successful in business and, and, and grow, you know, because I think when people don't deal with challenges, when, when, when they're not tested, mm -hmm they just become weaker uh, i don't know but but talk that's why i want to know about those two months like those yeah, two months yeah how were were they hard or, yeah. or were they kind of, or, or did you take it kind of as like oh this this is going on i'm just gonna yeah. i'm just gonna roll with it yeah so you know what during those that time i think it just taught me to be more resourceful i remember i started working early on so yeah. i started working as a handyman as an apprentice of sorts right painting drywall at 10 years old um, and what I'll say to the whole argument of strength, this is sort of the, the contradiction. It, it's, it tripped me out because I just figured this out like a few years ago. And trying to be so strong for my family, which is great, right, because you're a pillar of strength. Um, I realized for many years I couldn't cry because the one time I cried when I was a little kid that my mom was gone, it freaked all my brothers out. Like, yeah. oh, what the fuck is going on, right? Because you're their leader. Right. So then I realized... But that messed up my relationships moving forward when things were stable, when things were fine. I didn't show emotions when I should. And sometimes I think to myself, tr sometimes trying to be hard, trying to be strong makes you weak. Right? Yeah. There's a little bit of a contradiction there. So d during those months, it was um, just being resourceful. And there was, not, there was not a lot of moments of feeling sorry for yourself. You don't have time for that, right? It's just like, okay, I got to get them ready for school. I got to help them and get myself ready for school. After school, I'm going to go mow some lawns to make some money. I'm going to go help the neighbor do this because um, we had a neighborhood that had some houses around there. So I went around like, hey, 
I'll mow your lawn. I'll use your own lawnmower, blah, blah, blah. So just hustling, right? Trying to yeah. make some money. Yeah, so you don't, you don't have time to commiserate or really think about it. There's yeah. times at night, you know, you get down on yourself, but you're like, yeah, you just got to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what about when your mom comes back? How, how, was, how was that? Uh, when my mom came, came back, it felt good. It felt good. So then it felt, you know, uh, I think we all, need, we all need to feel safe. And sometimes like either our father or our mother kind of bring that safety. So it felt safe. So then we could get back into the groove of things. Um, and I think that's also why I was acting up, right? All this stuff was happening in my life that when I was going to school, I was just angry. I was angry with my teachers. I was punking kids. I was getting punked too, so I was getting into fights. Um, so I was acting up to my reality when I was in yeah. school. Um, but I think that that yeah. that makes you like when when you have to uh, defend yourself, mm -hmm. you have to fight back. Yeah. Like like nowadays, like I said, people just they they get their feelings hurt and they start crying and they want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> like when I when I grew up, like you, uh, yeah. I remember like there was this like like this big black kid yeah and he was like an oversized kid just a big black kid like yeah, like, like mike tyson <laughs> <laughs> yeah but he's you know how they, they like tall, they're they're taller and stronger like yeah. some of them so so this guy was just uh way bigger than his age mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. i remember he used to be a bully and and i remember like he he would always like i was scared because whenever whenever i would run into him in middle school mm -hmm. he would get me on headlocks to the point where i couldn't breathe and and so like Like I was, uh, I, I had to learn how to defend myself mm -hmm. and it's Granada Hills. So I go to Granada Hills and he takes the bus. I take the bus. So, so like, like we like Latinos and black people, we, we didn't belong there. Asians, we didn't belong there. We used to take the bus because we're the minorities. You were minor bused in. But yeah, the minorities were the one that were bused in from Got like it. the bad areas. Yeah. And most people there, like 95% of the students were all white. Mm. So we were just one of the bus people. And, and I remember that, that um, I, I, I was always trying to avoid and avoid him and not run into him. And I remember that, that one time, like he almost like choked me to death because I couldn't breathe. And, and then I said, you know what? Next time I see him, I'm, I'm just going to hit him back. I'm just going I'm, I'm gonna to throw a, like a punch and a kick. Uh -huh. and, and if I don't land... Uh, it might be the it might it might be the end. It might be the end of me. So, shit. so because I know if I land if, if I land one good one, like yeah. maybe he's watching this. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I mean, he probably follows me on social media. Yeah. But but um, but I remember the next time uh, he approached me, and and he he tried to grab me on the headlock, and I and I was really good at, at taking the air out of people, like punching them in the stomach. So I know I I landed a, a, a I punched him in the stomach hard and he was like oh and I took the air out of him uh -huh. and 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 then I I hopped on top of him and and I grabbed his 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 head like that I'm, so then I'm like I I I kicked his ass <laughs> and you and, were like and, a little midget yeah, compared to yeah him. <laughs> yeah and, and and I I I was brave and I I was strong but he was just bigger mm -hmm. but but after that punch in the stomach yeah like he never he became scared of me mm. so it was funny because. I'd say I'm like 5'3 or 5'2. I'm in middle school. I'm probably more like, yeah, 5'5, five, 5'4. Five, five, and, and, but this guy's like six foot. Mm -hmm. so, so after that time, it was funny because he was scared of me. So I, would, I, I started punking him. Mm -hmm. So I would always tell my friends, hey, look, he's coming. Let, look, let, 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 me, let, 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 me, let me punch him and, and grab him on the headlock. <laughs> so then I started doing that. Yeah. But, 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 and then he was, not, then he, it, beca it, turned, it turned the other way. So he became the one trying to avoid me. Okay. And then I became a bully. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to fucking punk all these kids now. So I started like, I, I started acting up like that too. But, but I was all, my, my, I had a, a my, my whole thing was I, I was just kind of mad. Yeah. Be because because I was away from my parents because I, I had to working? take that stupid school bus to go to school. Okay. I would wake up at five in the morning and mm -hmm. I would have to leave and I, I wouldn't get home till like 5 p.m. Sometimes like ar around 5 p.m. So I would get back. I needed to do homework, eat and go back to sleep to wake up again early. So I missed my, my, my house, like my, my family and, and I, I grew out. So I was very independent. Yeah. But the, the struggles, yeah. the b being bullied, that forced me to figure things out. And I think like th that, that did, that was probably similar to you because mm -hmm. you, you had no option. You had to figure it out. Right. So then that makes you better in business because in business, you, you know better than anybody. You always have to figure things out. It, every year it's yeah. a new challenge, new challenges and you got to figure things out. 
you always have to be recreating yourself to keep growing in business. So I think that had a big uh, deal in, in helping you become who you are. Yeah, the constant bully is the business, right? Itself. Yeah. And, and you, you probably learned how to, you, you probably started later on beating, well, you started beating kids up. Yeah, I had a bully too at some point that my nemesis, I couldn't beat up. And then one day, just kind of similar to your story, you just yeah. beat the crap out of him and he never, he wouldn't even come around. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen. Yeah, because because yeah. most bullies that they're they're used to uh, the other the people they bully they don't they don't fight back. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. even if you get your ass kicked, if you punch back and you land a punch in the in their face, mm -hmm. they're gonna think about it twice next yeah. time. Yeah. But but most people they just have to like fucking fight back. Yeah. But that's the thing with people today. Like people today, they don't fight back. They're very soft, and they can't even deal with um, feelings. Like like back then, feelings didn't even matter. No. But so so your your mom comes back and then what she gets deported again? How, yeah. how how old are you now when it happens again? Yeah, so when it happened again, I think I was 13. And it the the actual deportation was we had back then it was easy to go back and forth between the board. I remember, yeah. You just I almost yeah. I almost got my 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 friend <laughs> deported once. <laughs> Or I almost you got you took yeah. him on to the other side and then brought him back. I, or, no, or I, I was very close to it, and then I'm like, okay. "Fuck, good thing," because we we were we were out and and we went out to drink uh -huh. and and this was this was back back in um, the college the the post college days the college days, and and you know when you're when you're drinking sometimes um, you have great ideas, but you don't realize they're not the best. So, so like we're, we're drinking and we're, we're, we decide to go to uh, San Diego. So we're, I think we're out in orange, like in Fullerton. Mm -hmm. So we, we go out to like, there's a lot of partying in Fullerton with, with the college and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So we start drinking and then we have a great idea. We're like, Hey, let's go to, let, let's go to TJ. Let's go to TJ. I, I don't know if you, uh, we, we were, we were going to go party and we're like, they have Adelitas. We're going to go have some fun. Hong Kong. Uh, they didn't have Hong Kong <laughs> oh, back they then. Have then, but they had Adelitas. So, yeah. so we're like. Yeah, it's gonna be fun, and we're gonna party there till five, six in the morning. You know, we're 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 gonna get laid, uh, and so it it, it was it, we had an idea. So we we drove. So we're like, okay, we're gonna go. It was me, my cousin, and and then my friend Felipe. So we're like driving, right? And and we got to San Diego, and and we're like, okay, we're gonna do it. And and he doesn't have papers. He has he papers tells now. You, he tells yeah, well, he he. But but I'm like, yeah, it's easy, bro. You it's because it it was easier to pass back then. He had an ID. Yeah, all you say he, is he had, U.S. citizen. Yeah, he, yeah. Boom. So, so I'm like, just yeah. use your ID and, and just, you know, you just say you're a U.S. citizen and you'll pass back. And he's like, well, what if they check me? Yeah. We're what not if, condoning any crimes here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's like, well, what if they, what, what, what if they check? I'm like, chances are they're not going to check you, bro. Like it's like nine out of 10 times they don't check. Yeah. Like that's but, true. But if they, but if they pull you through security, dude, now he's fucked. So now I don't know how he gets <laughs> back. So Jeez. we drove, we got all the way to San Diego. We parked the car and we were gonna, we were about to cross. Mm -hmm. and we were thinking, should we leave the car here, cross walking or, uh, or take the car? And we parked and we started thinking about it. And then we're like, you know what, let's not do it. So we were very, very close, but, but <laughs> you do a lot of stupid things when, especially when you're young and, and when you're drinking and then when you're younger, like so many things that you shouldn't have done. Yeah, I never crossed the border drunk. But each time I crossed that, I was nervous. Yeah. Because I'd sit in the back seat and, you know, they'd just tell me, hey, say, you're a U.S. Citizen. You're a U.S. citizen. Yeah, I remember talking, those times. Talking yeah. English. Yeah. And I'd be freaking, freaking out right in the back, almost shaking. And then they'd ask me, citizenship? And American. And then they'd let us go. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was easy back then. Yeah. So the second time, my mom was actually deported trying to cross over. So she was hiding underneath. Uh, it was like a compartment on a truck in the back in the cab. They had a little compartment in the back, and she was in like in a box. And when she, they, they they came over, um, they found her. They found her. So they, it's funny because she tells me the story. They apprehended her, and then they flew her. She, she thinks they flew her to Las Vegas. Cause she said it was a desert on this rickety ass plane. She said she thought she was gonna die, and then they they locked her up in a detention center. And they were like feeding them crap. She's like, the, like they barely fed us anything, and it was cold, and I was using my hair 
to cover myself. So the second time she she was she was caught coming back. Ca yeah, caught crossing the border illegally. So so and this time she in. this time she didn't get like sent to Mexico. She got she got arrested. She got arrested. Yeah, because it was For the how second long? one. I don't know how long. I it was a few months because they had her. I think she, about a week in the detention center, and then they deported her. And then when they deported her, I mean, we always come back, right? Can't get rid of us. She came back successfully. Um, so when this happened, you're 13. 13. So yeah. you, I, by this 13, time, 14, by yeah. this time, you 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 kind of got to have it on lockdown. You're like, oh, I'm, we're, we're gonna be fine. I'm gonna yeah. The, the, the by this time, I'm like, okay, this is like how it goes. You got to take care of business. Yeah, and I was already working harder. Like you were making I, money already. I was making money. Yeah, just uh, construction jobs I could find, mowing grass. Something how how did you feel emotion, yeah. emotional, uh, emotion wise? Yeah. And, and like, were you sad? Were you uh, mad? Uh, yeah. What were you, what were you going through? You know what, when I was little, when I was 10, I, I was mad and I was sad. And then, and I, when I, when I got older and it happened the second time, I was like, we're just going to bounce back like yeah. we did last time. Yeah. You know, just, let's just keep going. Yeah. Let's just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So then you, you, you grow like that. So mm -hmm. tell me what, ha what happens next? You're, you're making a little bit of money doing uh, so some, some jobs. Yeah. Like what, when do you, like what happens next? When do you get like a, like a real job where you make real money yeah. or, or, or when, or what happens to your mom, to your, yeah. to your brothers? Yeah. So, I mean, really where I find my avenue, my own personal avenue that I think is going to take me somewhere is in education. Because the teachers are telling me, hey, go to college, get a degree, and you'll be able to find some freedom. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily work that way, but that, that moment, that made sense for me. And it was when I met this professor, right, this Irishman, <laughs> who I resonated with. Was he, was, was he the Jewish guy? No. No, that's another guy. That guy made me a trust fund baby. Mm -hmm. This was back at UCLA. This is later in UCLA. So anyway, I get on track. I have, a f I have jobs after school, and I go to school, and I just kill it in school. I just... Boom, boom, boom. I'm doing really well. And I start to become proud of myself, too. Like, dang, I'm, I'm smart. You know, because when you, you had the same experience, probably. Growing up, you're like the little wetback. You don't know anything. I think you said you were put in, like, remedial classes where they almost... ESL and special ed. And special yeah. ed, yeah. So, same sort of... In, in elementary school, I'm like, I, I think I'm remedial, right? I think yeah. I'm... I got issues with myself. Yeah. But then I start doing well. High school comes around. Boom, boom, boom. Killing it graduate with like a 4.0 captain of my academic decathlon team right which is just did you have a, did, you, did you have a high school babe oh my God. i had i had a few girls yeah yeah <laughs> i didn't but i didn't have time like i like like i wanted to man because yeah. i couldn't get involved cuz i had a job right after yeah. school so anyway i realized i couldn't go to college but i had a teacher again another person who said hey screw it frank go ahead and apply write an essay and tell them your situation. So I applied to NYU, Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, like all the top schools. I was like, screw it. Look, I busted my chops. I'm going to go ahead and apply. I got interviewed for Harvard. I didn't get in. I got into NYU, New York University. I got into UCLA. Uh, I got into Berkeley. And then I decided ultimately to go to UCLA because it's still close to home. And I still am, I feel responsible for my mom, right? So when I go to UCLA, uh, I'm like, how the hell am I going to pay my tuition? So, and where the hell am I going to live? I had been saving up some money because I had also been working in the summers in Vegas. My mm -hmm. uncles own a construction company. Yeah. So I've been working for them in the summers. I had been saving money. So I had my tuition money. And so then what I did, because I didn't know where I was going to live, I started calling the newspaper ads that were renting rooms for rent on the west side, right here on the west side of L.A., which is all Jewish. And I started pitching them like, hey, I'm a student. I just got into UCLA. I'm really excited. But I don't have money to pay for room and board. What if I work for you in exchange for rent? I got a bunch of no's, but I got like three yeses, maybes. Mm -hmm. And I went, met with them, and pitched them again. And there was this one Jewish lady, Greta First. She's, she's actually very famous in Hollywood. Her husband used to run Universal Studios. He was an executive, uh, Lionel First. They told me, Frank, we like you, but we have an in-home nanny that lives with here, and she has a little daughter, and they wouldn't feel comfortable with a, another young man living here. But I'm going to refer you to Sid and Jackie. So this is a Jewish family. I ended up meeting with them. They like me. They're like, hey, we travel a lot. We're retired. 
So we need someone to watch our house when we're gone, feed our dog. And then when we're here, we need someone to wash our clothes, right? So basically, I worked there. There is like a mansion? Yeah, it was uh, on the west side right next to Century City. This was not a mansion. This was like a 3-2. But, you know, uh, 1.2 million at that time, mm -hmm. back in the early 2000s. And then through them, I got in contact with the, their Jewish network. And I started working for rich Jewish folks. But right before I started working for them, um, it came out that I was undocumented. Back then it was illegal because they told, I told them, hey, you guys know where I can find a job? They're like, yeah, our friend owns Tito's Tacos. I don't know if you've ever eaten at Tito's Tacos. Uh, it's, it's in near Venice on Washington and Washington Place, Culver City, actually. So the owner of Tito's Tacos is actually Mexican. Uh, he's Jewish. His mom came from uh, Poland to Mexico lived in Mexico for a little bit and then crossed the border illegally. Yeah. Anyway, and he, he owned Tito's Tacos, right? Uh, so anyway, I went to apply to Tito's Tacos for a job, but I had fake papers and they caught me. And when I got caught, I felt really embarrassed. So I went back to my fake papers or like the fake social, the fake social. And it was a bad one, man. I had the picture that was it wasn't imprinted. It was like a copy of a, it was like a cutout of a picture. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. Yeah, it was bad. I thought I could get away with it. I was just desperate trying to get a job. So anyway, they, they catch me. So I freak out and I go back to sit in Jackie's house and I, I come out to them. I'm like, look, your buddy's probably going to tell you that I applied for a job at his business and I don't have real papers. Let me tell you what the situation is. I'm illegal here. They freaked out. They're like, Frank, are we gonna get in trouble? Frank, how is it that you're illegal and you're going to UCLA? So anyway, we squared things away and that was helpful because then they, they understood my situation and they started telling their friends like, hey, we got this kid, he's illegal, but you could pay him under the table. So I started working for Norman, the owner of Tito's Tacos, mm. and he became my financial sponsor. So every quarter I got my grades, I would go to Norman. I'm like, hey, Norman, I got, I got good grades. He would say, I'm going to give you a couple grand, but also you're going to work for me. Norman was a businessman. Norman used to sit down with me during my lunch break when I worked for him, smoke a cigar. I was eating my food that his wife would make for me. He'd smoke a cigar and he'd start to tell me about business. He started to tell me about how he was taking insurance money to buy properties. He started to tell me about he, how he owned all these other businesses. He'd tell me about deals that he was making and stuff like that. For a 17, 18, 19 year old kid, that was like over my head. But now as I reflect, I'm like, man, this guy was like handing me jewels, right? At that age, I just didn't understand it. The other thing, he passed away in 2020. His lawyer called me in 21 and said, hey, Frank, Norman put you down as his trust fund beneficiary. I was like, what? I haven't talked to Norman in a couple years. Like, how is it that he's, he thought that highly of me, right? Or at least. Is he the guy with the, with the three, one, with the three, two, the, the house? That yeah. You were? No, no, no. That's another. One. So uh, Norman, Norman. Norman was introduced to you by them. Yeah. So I met the, the Sid and Jackie. Norman was their friend and he lived in Brentwood. They lived on the West side in West LA. He lived in Brentwood over by um, where uh, was the football player that where the glove doesn't fit. OJ. Oh. <laughs> In that community. OJ Simpson. So anyway, yeah, so so I was exposed to business in that way and I was exposed to extreme wealth. A lot of these yeah. Jewish folks are generationally wealthy, right? And their kids, like their kids are going went to Oxford and Harvard and like so that was very inspirational to me. So I finished up UCLA. But no, but Norman is the Jewish guy. Norm they're all Jewish. Yeah. Right? Norman, Norman is the guy who owns Tito's Tacos. Norman. Who's Mexican, right? He doesn't say he's Mexican, but I told him you're Mexican because your mom oh. lived in Mexico and then came illegally to the U.S. So Norman was Mexican? No, he was, he was, he was white. He was oh, Ashkenazi. But you just, you, you, but he was, I, I you just called him. Mexicans of the restaurant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, what, so 2020, he passed away and he leaves you something? Yeah, yeah he, he puts me down as a beneficiary. When you look at his trust, and out of the respect to, for the family, I'm not going to say how much I got, <coughs> but... Um, when you look at the trust and the beneficiaries, it's like family and I'm the only ra one right there and the Mexican, right? So I was like, I felt touched. I didn't even care about how much money it was. I'm like, what the heck? Like, I only knew Norman for maybe like 10, 15 years. And I only worked for him for like f a solid five years. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he would think of me and say, hey, put Frank down. 
I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen. As a beneficiary. So, so 2020, when, when you get that news, are, yeah. you, are you good financially or are you so-so? or? Yeah, so let's see. When Around 2013 is when I got some legal status. 2013. Uh, Obama passed the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is basically a work permit. I, I was able to get a work permit. So by that time, I'm like 30 years old. Mm -hmm. before, that, I was, before that, I was just consulting 1099 all over mm -hmm. the place. I, I 1099 at UCLA Health for like five years Yeah. Um, and while I was going to school. And then in like 14, I got, I got papers. And that year was... My life changed like that because I got fifty thousand dollars in scholarships. The Mexican president, uh, Peña Nieto, he flew down. He gave me a scholarship. Jerry uh, Jerry Brown was the governor. He was there. Uh, Eric Garcetti was the governor. They had this big old thing. Um, so like my life changed. I got all this money in scholarships. I had a full time job as an analyst for UCLA Health, analyzing deals, because my background is business econ at UCLA. So. But it, it changed because my immigration status changed and now I could apply for scholarships and now I could take out loans. I never took out loans. I graduated with zero debt because I paid it all off mm -hmm. or I got a bunch of scholarships. So in 21, when I got the news, in 21, when I got the news, I had just gotten fired from my uh, corporate America job. And that's what turned me into an entrepreneur. Yeah. So UCLA. Yes. You went to UCLA for how long? Uh, I went to UCLA for like four and a half years, but and I you, had a, a gap. I dropped out for a little bit because I had a kid. And and and, and did you um, did you get a degree there? And what was your degree? Yeah. So my degree was in uh, business econ. Yeah, business econ. I thought. So I, you got a bachelor's in that. A bachelor's, correct. And yeah. then once 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 you got that, then you you stopped. You you started working. I started working. Yeah. So. Tell us about about UCLA and and your degree. Yeah, how has that helped you in in your in your business yeah. life? Uh, did did that have a a big impact? Yeah. or or not really? Yeah. Or what what is your your honest opinion on that? Yeah, you know what? My honest opinion is because I because I, I hear I hear people say yeah uh, I didn't learn shit in college. <laughs> I, I I it was a waste of time. Usually, usually, yeah, ninety nine point nine percent of people say 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 that they're like, yeah, you know, it was good. I yeah. learned some stuff, but yeah. I'm not using any of that in my business today. Mm -hmm. But but like like because I asked this to uh, among many, uh, Neil Patel. So Neil Patel got yeah. his marketing degree. Okay, and and he he says like I didn't learn shit in college. Like it, mm -hmm. it was in it was a waste of time. Like yeah. like but but what 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 did it do for you? You know what it pros and cons. Yeah, pros and cons. I think pros, I wouldn't have met all these Jewish folks mm -hmm. and gone through those hard times and all the learning. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't have become a trust fund beneficiary if I hadn't gone to UCLA. But that's kind of outside of UCLA. Mm -hmm. Cons, uh, yeah, I could see a lot of the classes I took were a waste of time, to be honest with you. And sometimes I was sitting in class, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to apply this in life, right? It's kind of cool to understand history. It's kind of cool to understand, you know, social stu studies, this and that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how I'm going to apply, apply it. So for me, it was like I'm, I'm working on my brain, right? I'm learning how to study, research stuff. And now, you know, when you're in business, you got to la cabeza, right? Yeah, you have yeah. to really crack your head open to solve problems. So it did help me kind of think differently about certain problems. Now when I'm sitting in front of clients, and where we're, we, the problem, the client has some, some sort of problem, I can think back, okay, you know, let, let me research, let me go research this area. I've learned this. I would say 50-50 a waste of time and 50-50 actually helped me. But I think what helped me was because it was hard. I think people who go to school, they get financial aid or they get all these scholarships and they drink because there was a lot of that. A lot of my friends would be drinking. They have the, the frat parties. The frat parties yeah. are great. I, I've used been to drive, I used to park in UCLA to yeah. go to the frat parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I, me, and my buddy, wild. me and my buddy would park there and just party with the frat, yeah. frat people. Yeah, so 
I did I did a couple parties, but most of the time I was working. Right? And they have the in and out. They have the in and out. Yeah. They have this thing called Fat Sal's. It's really famous. Oh yeah, I know the owner. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 It's a good place when you're hungover. You want to sober uh-huh. up. Uh huh. Yeah. So I would say about 50-50. You know, like my yeah. son right now, he's in the middle of either going to UCLA or Stanford. And I told him, go to Stanford because at least all the technologists, all the startups are over there. Yeah. UCLA, you know, it's, it's a so you, fantastic you encur- school. So you encourage them to go to college or do you tell them they do whatever you guys want to do? My, my son in particular, he, he wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Like I would have preferred him to do business. And in fact, I still do. He wants to be a therapist because he had a 5150 situation where you try to commit suicide and that helped them really find himself. And then he's why, like, why, why, want- why did that happen? During COVID, like my son is a nerd, like a geek. He was in robotics. He taught me about crypto like 10 years ago mm-hmm. or seven years ago. Um, like he was telling me about, dad, did you know you, we mine for coins? I'm like, you guys are digging holes in the ground and getting coins. He's like, no, we do it on computers. I'm like, what the hell? So then I bought crypto back when it was really hard to buy crypto and I've held on to it and it's appreciated like crazy. So anyway, he buy any Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah, Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, I have a whole little wallet there that I've just been sitting there and appreciating. Yeah. I don't even touch it. So, But it was because him and his friends were geeks and he was in robotics. And then COVID happened and he got depressed. And then he, he drank a thing of bleach. Bleach? Yeah, like he wanted to kill himself. He drank, like grabbed a gallon and drank it. Ended up vomiting. And then we found out. So... We took him to get help and they institutionalized him for like a few a few weeks. And when he was there, he was like, Dad, there's kids here that actually have it hard. There's a girl that's being raped. You know, there's a kid that, that he's like, I have it easy. I'm like, great, son. I'm glad you went. And then he got back on track and now he's, he wants to help people. He wants to be a therapist. And I told him, look, I have, I have a client. So a mind, a mind therapist? Uh, yeah, a mind therapist, a social, you know, like a, yeah, a therapist, a yeah. behavioral therapist. Where you help uh, people that are uh, depressed. depressed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, but I told him, check this out, son. I have a, a guy that owns like five clinics. He employs 150 therapists. And he tells me that they're all screwed up mentally because they all wanted to help people, but then they get caught up in the nine to five, right? They're having to do paperwork, reports, and this and yeah. that. And they're not happy. So they're depressed. Do you really want that? Wouldn't you rather own the clinic and hire the therapist and build the culture for people to work in so it's healthy? So I told him, go to Stanford, learn technology, integrate technology with therapy and do that. So that's, you know, I'm pushing him in that direction, but he really wanted to do a school. For him, a school was like yeah. the thing. Yeah. Obviously, my daughter, you already know, uh, she's, I think she's got more of the entrepreneurial edge with her and that's why yeah. i bring her to events introduce you to you yeah. know to people like you and other other business owners that are successful are you close so l- l- your yeah. kids so are, are you close to all of them are you closer to one of them uh closer to my daughter because she has yeah. my, more of my personality yeah, <laughs> yeah. so your so your daughter is 10 10 you, yeah. you, and then your son is how old my son is 19 and yeah. then you have another one and then i have a two-year-old oh yeah, sure. a little one yeah like a nine-year difference between the kids yeah, i'm mexican yeah. too so they're all from different ladies yeah <laughs> well lucky you um, i don't know about lucky but yeah lucky yeah. i have the kids that's beautiful yeah so so like how how is it uh communicating with with all the moms you know what uh well my son i don't have to communicate anymore yeah because he's older because yeah. he's older he's yeah. an adult i have an excellent relationship with camila's mom yeah excellent relationship and then i'm not going to say much about my my youngest daughter that yeah. relationship is a little rocky so a lot of stuff gets done in court Mm. for that one yeah yeah that's crazy so so right now right now you're single (laughs) no no i have a partner uh she's my business partner yeah and also my partner she's out of florida yeah yeah we started a company together yeah yeah that's awesome so so i i mean question because i i want to know i want to learn a little bit uh, on how to handle that so uh how how complicated or 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 how do you make it seem, how do you make it seem easy? Cause like I never having, you have three kids once wasn't once an adult. Yeah. Uh, and they're all way different ages. Yeah. 
like it, you you have it's a, it's a very very unique uh yeah. situation cuz 19 10 and 2 yeah and then it's three like well three different moms yeah but then right now you have your your business your 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 partner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how how do you keep it, how do you make it seem so easy cuz cuz yeah. I, I always see you focused and yeah. I, I can see like I would be I would be like um I would lose focusness. I don't know if, I, if, if it makes any sense, but I, I would, it, it would be way too much stuff yeah. for me to focus on the business because it's, yeah. it's a see, lot of stuff that. going on. So, so how do you uh, keep composed yeah. and, and still win in business? You know, you know what helps a lot? Well, first of all, there, there's such a gap that like my son, when he's around, he helps with his sister, Camila. Mm -hmm. She loves him. Yeah. Right. So he, like, hey, son, can you watch her? I got to go run and do some stuff. Um, then Camila helps with the two-year-old. Yeah. Simple stuff like that. And yeah. the other thing is I retired my parents, right? Uh, my stepdad, he's not, he never raised me, but I love him. And then my mom, I retired them. So my mom helps me out a lot. So she watches the kids. Like I, today there's a pickup at 6 p.m. Mm. So my mom goes and picks up uh, the little one. Yeah. Right. So my mom, 100% helps me out a lot. So that allows me to focus because she knows you're – you're holding down the family, so uh, by financially. How, how, how's your mom uh, health wise now? Does, does she is, is she uh, yeah. healthy now, or does, does yeah. she? Yeah. So my mom is very healthy. So we come from uh, my mom comes from a rancho mm -hmm. in Nayarit in Mexico, and my grandmother lived till about eighty five, eighty eight. Yeah. About, and the lady was in her eighties, and she was feeding the puercos. And she was carrying the, the buckets, like the five gallon buckets full of food. And she'd go into the back. I remember watching her and feed them. So she comes from a very sturdy, um, very good genes, right? So my mom, thank God, is very healthy because if she got sick. How old is your mom now? Yeah, my mom is 62 years old. Oh, she's pretty young. Yeah. And then my stepdad, this is a, this is a little curveball that life threw at us. My stepdad is 100% bedridden. He's in diapers. My mom has to spoon feed him because he, he's only 56. He's only 56 years old. He got uh, an autoimmune condition that paralyzed him. So um, my mom has to take care of him. As a, you know, she's the nurse 100%. I bring in some nurses to help out. And unfortunately, you know, my mom's still undocumented because once you get deported several times, you yeah. never fix again. And that's, the only way I can fix her papers is if I become president in Mexico. And then I'm able to bring her back and forth. So that's that's on the to do list right there. Um, so. So, yeah, so we have we have a very strong family, man. The strong so, so family really helps. So me. your stepdad is 52, you said 56, 56. 56. Yeah. And, and can can he like move he, his head and talk? He can move his head and he can talk. Sometimes it's hard to hear, like understand what he says. Yeah, because it's a he caught a, it, not he caught, but uh, he. He developed an autoimmune condition. But where does that come from? That's How? neurological. Like the doctors can't explain it. I think COVID triggered it, set it off, and then his whole nervous system just started eating itself. That's the way it was described to me. So he's not, a, he's stable now. And, and the thing about him, what he teaches me is what really matters. Like around Christmas, I'll be like, Alvaro, ¿qué se te antoja? Like, what do you want for Christmas? And he tells me what it what really matters. He's like, I want you guys to be here. I want the girls to come over. I want the family to be here. Alvaro yeah. is, is your stepdad. My stepdad, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he teaches me every day. You know, I see him before I leave the house because they live with me. I'm like, Alvaro, ahí nos vemos. And he, I, you know, te cuidas, hijo, right? With a, you know, weak voice. But he reminds me, like, man, we are so blessed. Like, the fact that you and I are strong, we have you know, health, we have brains and, you know, we're functional. That's something to be very thankful for. Yeah. So, so like <clears throat> yeah. one of the guys that I really admire yeah. is Ed Milet. Mm -hmm. Uh You know who he is, right? Yeah. He Ed just Milet. got sick, didn't he? Yeah. He's, yeah. he's, he's working on his health, but, but, uh, we we're always texting. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. some reason, I, I, I don't know if, um, he thinks about me uh, on Sundays, or I think about him on Sundays, like because because uh, Sundays like I'll have some mimosas, uh, 
I, I kind of chill uh, okay. half of the day with my my wife, my my kids, my girls, mm -hmm. and we'll get in the pool, things like that. I feel like he kind of does the same. Maybe he smokes a cigar. He likes to drink tequila, mm -hmm. and, and maybe he's thinking about like he he's just like, hey, uh, I'm gonna hit up Albert. So we're like texting back and forth. Yeah. So uh, he's been telling me like, hey, you know, the last two years they've been rough for for in real estate and mortgage with the rates and all that. I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over thirty million dollars a year, text me at two one three. 277-6208 and let's make it happen. And and he sent he he told me something that that I, I wanna say it again here. Okay. Because uh he said uh well I'm not gonna read all of it, but but he sends me like these long uh, messages, right? He types that up? Yeah, he types wow. me, yeah, we're, we're like he he's like, I love you brother and I really admire you and like he's he 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 tells me a lot of stuff and, and I really appreciate him. And, and he says, um, I'm sure they're so damn proud of you. He's talking about my parents. Mm -hmm. I, know you, I know the story of you and your dad painting houses. And every time I hear mm -hmm. that story, it makes me emotional because I remember mm -hmm. dry walling houses on weekends with my dad for extra money. So he mm -hmm. tells me this, that, that, that connects to what we're talking about. I know what it's like to lose a dad that you admire and I'm really grateful my dad saw so many things happen while he was alive. And I know your dad is probably blown away by your success, but we both know there's other levels for you to get to and you need to do it quickly so he can see it. Mm, damn. So so um, damn. me and him talk uh, every Sunday it seems, either Saturday or, or Sunday, we're, we're like just texting back and forth. Mm -hmm. And it's where we're relaxed we're in a state of mind where we're relaxed and, and we're, we're happy. Mm -hmm. And he's giving me advice, right? So I, I, I was thinking about this, that we, me and you right now, you said we're, we're, we're young and strong. We're in our prime. You're, you're, you're I think, the same age, right? Are, are you younger or you're? Yeah, I'm 40. I think you're 40. Yeah, I'm 41. 41? I'm 41. Okay. So, so what, for a man, their prime mm -hmm. is their 40s. That's their prime, whether people uh, uh, agree or not. Yeah, a man's at his prime from f like 40 to 49. Like the 40s are, are the prime for a man. Now, we got to like kind of do it as fast as we can because we want to make That's sure that point. we reach massive success right now in the next couple of years, maybe yeah. in the next 12 months, mm -hmm. so that our parents can see it. Because mm -hmm. if it takes us another six, seven years, who knows if they're still here? That's true. And 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 another thing that I I, I was because I, I take a lot of notes, I was um, uh, listening to uh, Ed Milet, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and he was saying that that Americans mm -hmm. they they live on average 78, 78 years. Mm -hmm. H however, you, you know how many years you spend sleeping. You, you guys know how many years you sleep. Uh, two. You spend twenty eight years sleeping. Wow. Mm. So out of your 78 years, if you live 78 years, right? 28 of those years you spend sleeping. Jeez. When you take into account the hours, because 24 hours in a day, you're not awake all those hours, right? Mm -hmm. So 28 years of your life, you spend sleeping. Uh, and, and then when you take into account, like you, you spend about 12 years working and then about four years shopping uh on social media with your friends at the bar getting your nails done eyelashes all that stuff when you when you do all the math when you do all the math you have you live you really only live eight years so eight <laughs> years is what you're living okay when you take it and and this came from ed my let's mouth okay and and then none of us here are newborns right Right. So that means we have less time to live. And and think about like you're you're uh it's so cool that you live that your parents uh, live with you mm -hmm. because at least you get to see them every day. Mm -hmm. Because most people uh, when they move out, especially business people like us that don't live with our parents, mm -hmm. think about it. How many times and special and, and imagine those that don't live in the same state. Right? How many times do you see your parents? So some people see their parents five times a year, two times a year, or once a month, 
-hmm. right? So, so if you think about it, let's just say that, um, imagine that we have, we have uh, five more years in this world. Like maybe our parents have five more years. So you got to think about it. So if you see your parents two times a year for, you know, an average person or, or even a little bit more, but if you see uh, your parents two times a year, right? And, and there's only five more years left mm -hmm. for them to be alive or you to be alive or both of you to be alive, mm -hmm. then that means you, you're only going to see your parents 10 more times, right? So you got to think about like when you see your parents the next time, now you only have nine more times. You see yeah. your parents another time, now you only have eight more times. Yeah. Yeah. Be, because you don't see your parents all, and then when you and, and then when you have them so close, some, most most people don't take them for granted. So what we're like with your story that just brought all this out, and me thinking about what Ed Milet tells me, and then also Jesse Itzler. I don't know if you know who Jesse Itzler is, but yes. yeah, like he cool he one, he's right? the one that uh, he came to one of the driven events. Uh -huh. I went to his house, and and this is where I got this that some people see their parents once a year, mm -hmm. summertime. Or, 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 or whatever that looks like. So if there's only eight more years, then that means you're gonna see them eight more times. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you get the point. But the thing is that I, I think we have to uh, value time more. Uh, I, I, I understand the value of time. You, so do you. Time is more important than money. Mm -hmm. uh, money is used to buy time. That's why the wealthy get the money to buy themselves more time. And most people, they waste so much time gossiping, watching the news instead of creating the news, being on social media, looking at other people's things when they should be posting so that other people see their stuff, spending time with uh, toxic people, you know, just with negative people. When, when if you just focus every minute, like like one of the things that I do that Ed Milet does is he um, gets three days out of one. Mm. I don't know if you heard about that. Where, where you where yeah, break the day up, right? Yeah, where, where people ha get seven days out of the week mm -hmm. and, and the, high, the elite performers, they get 21 days out of a week. Mm. Because I'm sure you've had a morning that, that it's, it's 11.30 p uh, in the morning, not even 12 yet. And you're like, man, this morning in the first six hours, I've accomplished so much. I, I've, I've, I have so many wins. I've done more than I've done in the last month in just one morning. So when you start uh, giving it so much importance of your hour, your minutes, and you're able to accomplish so many things from six in the morning till 12 p.m., and then boom, you close that part of that, that, that mini day. Then from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., you, re, you reset and you start again, you're starting a brand new day and you get the most out of those six hours. And by the time it's six, like it's gonna be six today, right? It's gonna be six right now. You get so much done mm -hmm. and then you're like, okay, reset, then 6 p.m. all the way till midnight, you get a, 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 everything you can those next six hours. So the elite, they just, they're like getting so much value out of their day. And that's why you don't have time to worry about or, or spend wasted minutes on, on like nonsense. And I think most people here, like they gotta stop spending time on nonsense and focus on things that are gonna be uh, productive to your life, you know, so that when you have those extra minutes or, or hours, you could spend them like with your stepdad, with your mom, mm -hmm. with, your, with your, your kids. Let me ask you a question, Albert, because this is, this is very interesting when I meet different entrepreneurs, because I think it's the way it sets the pace for the rest of your day. What's your morning ritual? Do you have a morning ritual and what does that look like? Because I think in order to be very effective with your day and your time, yeah. you have to have a morning ritual in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering what your morning ritual looks it, like. It, every morning I have to be up by five, okay. by five to six, six latest. But but the way I, I the way I run my day is mm -hmm. I need six hours of sleep. Okay. Uh, that's I, I try to sleep more, but I can't. I, I just, my body doesn't do it. But uh, if I sleep at midnight, mm -hmm. then I'll wake up at six. If I sleep at 11, I'll wake up at five. Mm -hmm. So the, my, my number one rule, mm -hmm. which, I, which I think would be very valuable for everybody watching this is before 12, I do not take appointments, meetings, 
12 p.m. Uh, before 12 p.m. Yeah, I'm not gonna do trainings, meetings, okay. phone calls. You know, Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not gonna do any of that. Okay. Be because by 12 p.m. You you have to get all the important things out of the way. So like, I want to do only important things. So a lot of my from from six in the morning till 12, I want to do like the most important things to me. So a lot of that is working on myself, mm -hmm. self improvement, working on the business, and 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 also uh, I think it's very important to prospect two hours in the morning. So I do I do two hours of prospecting in the mornings. I want to outbound. I, I, I want to uh, tell people that I'm alive. I don't know if you notice a lot of successful people, mm -hmm. they go live in the mornings. Now they're doing it more than, uh, may, may, maybe they got it from me. Because okay. I'm the one that started <laughs> doing the lives in the morning. I see you early <clears> in the morning. For an hour, two hours. Live, yeah. So, so, so think about this. You, you know how I, how I do my lives. I, I, yeah. I think I've told you, but my lives are not, I'm not there to like spend so much energy and, and give lessons. I just go live and I just let it sit there because I'm just looking for leads and the leads that come in, they go to my sales team or, or they go, they go in, into my go high level, my mm -hmm. CRM, mm -hmm. but I'm working like on myself. So you see me on the computer. So I'm typing stuff up. Uh, I'm, I'm on my cell phone. Um, I'm, I'm doing things uh, that are important and, and the, the live is going on at the same time because I, I pin at the bottom. If you're a business owner, you're making over 500 K common business because those are going to be leads that come in and and i i want to let people know that i'm alive so i know that that's the right thing to do because i see people like gary v doing lives in the morning all the time i see i see people like uh i, I see david Meltzer doing lives in the morning there all mm -hmm. the time i see um uh neil patel going live in the mornings a lot of the times so so like like my my before twelve, if, if I have meetings, appointments, or 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 phone calls mm -hmm. before twelve, then it's gonna I, it's gonna get in the way of my my whole morning routine. So that's what I like to do from from the I have like a whole list of things that I do. But obviously, you know, you brush your teeth, you do other things in the mornings, mm -hmm. drink mm -hmm. water, and and things like that like that. But I like to do the important things. But mainly working on the business and working on yourself. Mm -hmm. and two hours of prospecting. So we're running ads all the time now and, and we're doing other uh, other ways of reaching people because because the, the way I see it is I want to communicate. I, I want a billion people to know me and I want to com communicate with billions of people um, in the world, not, not only in California or the US. Yeah. So that's what I do in the morning. And then, and then from 12 to six, that's when uh, I'm okay to uh, do podcast. I'm okay to do... Uh, trainings or phone calls or zoom calls or meetings or or whatever but but i that's how i run my day but in the morning mm -hmm. six in the morning till 12 i really think that 12 p.m your day is over what do i mean by that by 12 p.m i want to feel like i have accomplished more than everybody in the world because i was so productive so that's why i just don't want to get distracted or or um or bothered mm -hmm. uh, before twelve. That's just, that's the way I run my my morning. I imagine somewhere in there, and this is an Elliot question. You have a workout in that early morning, right? Third, the first yeah. third of your. So so what I what I do is is um, I used to work out. I, it always changes because because I I call it my power schedule. Okay. But as as my requirements change. I, I change. There's a really good book that I recommend. Uh, it's called "Who Moved My Cheese." Have you read it? No. Who I've moved never my heard Who, of it. who, who, who my Moved My Cheese? cheese. Okay. Really good book. Uh, I'm gonna have Italia read it. Uh, have your daughter read it for sure. Okay. She she's already old, old enough for that. So this book is about a, a mouse. Mm. So a mouse is going through the maze, and there's a maze, and the mouse knows where the cheese is. So what happens is one day. They, 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 they change the mace. They, they block the, the, his route. Mm -hmm. So then the mouse can't get to the cheese. So the mouse is starving. It's dying. And, and, and then what happens? The, the mouse needs mm -hmm. to figure out how to get to the cheese. So in business, you always have to be able to pivot. So for example, one thing that I'm doing now is, is now I'm not that available anymore. 
before I, I, I used to be, I used to be in the office all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, it was not a money-making activity. I was wasting more. I, I was wasting time. I, I, I was too available and people were not, um, people were becoming entitled. People were, were taking advantage. People were wasting my time. So mm -hmm. now I notice that when I'm, when, when, when I'm, I'm always in and out, every minute has to count. So I'm, notice, I'm noticing that now people are like, damn, uh, when they see me, they see me and, and they're more excited. They appreciate me more. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm just super, super focused because, uh, you know, when, one day when, when times change, you got to change too. So like my schedule is always changing. What I used to do in the mornings, like for example, when I used to work out in the morning, mm -hmm. now I have to work out in the evening mm -hmm. because now in the morning part, I have to stack it with other stuff. So, so what, what I do in the mornings, for mm -hmm. example, like I, I fast, so I don't eat anything. Mm. Uh, my first meal is like at 12. So when I finish my, my, my whole morning part, what I'll do is I'll do some cardio and, and then shower. And, and, then, and then I start my second day. And then after my second day, I'll go work out like 6 p.m., 7 p.m. And that's when I get my workout in. So it, mm -hmm. it, it's just, mm -hmm. it's changed over time. But uh, I just feel like if, if you, if there's like Ed Milet said, there's different levels. There's different levels. And, and the more, the more you, uh, you grow, you got to change a lot of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I, I was telling Syl this morning, I'm like, damn, I, you know what? I can't believe um, how, how, many, uh, how many disgusting people exist in the world a lot of beautiful people a lot, a lot of nice people but a lot of disgusting people that have so much hate mm. you know like like uh like i'm not okay with that there, there's there's a lot of people that have so much hate people that want to um people that want to hurt other people mm. people that want to take advantage unethical people uh the the, the robbers you know the, the there's just so many people that are evil out there so I think it's very important for people like us mm -hmm. to, uh, especially to the Latino community, you know, because we're Latinos to be a good role model for them. 100%. Uh, yeah. be, because if, if you're going to do bad things, they're going to come back. I, I really believe in karma. So all we can do is just be good role models so that we could be a good example to the rest of the people out there. And be, because what you said, uh, you, you touched on it a little bit in, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You're uh, Camila. Mm -hmm. She's not gonna do what you tell her to do. Mm -hmm. Italia, Berlin, you know, like like they're not gonna do what I tell them to do. Mm -hmm. They're gonna do what they see us doing. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna come apart. Like your Camila's already big. Mm -hmm. She thinks so you you can't bullshit bullshit her anymore. No, like no, she no. knows when you're when you're lying and when and, 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 and when you're <laughs> when when you're doing things you're not supposed to. Yeah. Like they, they catch it like this. They're yeah. they're smart. They're adults already. Yeah. They're they're little adults. So. Your, your children, they come to an age when they're like, you, you, can't, you can't bullshit me anymore, dad. Yeah. So you, you have to make sure that you are being a great example to them because yeah. that's what they're going to do. They're going to do what they see yeah. the dad doing, the, the leader doing. Yeah. You know what, what hit me right now that you said is how we have to accelerate our, our success because yeah. we don't have that much time. We take it for granted. Our time is limited. It's, right? it's counted. And our folks are going to pass. Yeah. And this is our prime. Yeah. Yeah. Bro. This is our prime. My, my parents, my dad's 75, my mom's 73. Wow. They're not in the most, uh, they're not the, in, the, in, the, in the healthiest condition right now. Mm. You know, so, so mm. like I, I have um, urgency right now to make a lot of stuff happen in the next 12 wow. months. So like that, that uh, it's a reality check for me at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm sure for you, for you too. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 um, Closing, closing uh, thoughts right here. I, I, I want to bring up something. I know that you are you're very passionate about mm -hmm. um, this event that you have once a year. You're helping other uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah. And and you're 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 planning on um, you have big plans, but I, w I want you to tell us about it. it it's it's yeah. called Negosi. Yeah, yeah. So I'm an angel investor in different companies, and one of the ones that I'm an investor in is called Negosi. It's like if Driven and LinkedIn had a baby. <laughs> Right. So it's a social media platform like LinkedIn. There's an app for it. 
and it also has events. We're having an event in Houston. There's one in Chicago. I'm taking Camila to that one in yeah. Chicago on the 19th. We're having another one in New York, in Queens. Actually, I was going to extend an invite to you. That one's about 350 people. So we have events throughout the country, and it's a, a social media platform specifically for Latino, Spanish-speaking entrepreneurs. Our mantra is, en Estados Unidos se hace negocio en español, because we know that there are barriers to entry to doing business in the U.S., so we bring resources to them and, and a lot of a lot of mindset stuff, but a lot of technical stuff. Like we'll bring in the IRS to talk to business owners, the franchise tax board. You we'll actually bring, bring the IRS? Kids. Yeah. Yeah. We, we just had an event with the franchise tax board. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we got to understand the rules, right? So yeah. that we could work, work with the rules and work yeah. around the rules. Yeah. So um, and so we provide technical training, the SBA. Uh, banks, we have corporate sponsors. And so the goal right now is we're creating different verticals within Ngozi. We have the CPA tax vertical. We're building the, the real estate vertical. Uh, I'm working on the legal vertical with my partner Shiva. He's a lawyer. Um, and then the insurance vertical. So the insurance vertical, for instance, we're gonna make an agency out of that. Um, with the legal, we're actually gonna create a law firm. And then I'm gonna, because I work with a lot of lawyers and I should probably get, be getting a cut every time I refer a lawyer, well, I can create a, I don't have to be an attorney, I found out. I can create a law firm and get a, yeah. a nice referral for, for that. So anyway, but the goal of this Negozi platform is to empower Spanish speaking entrepreneurs. And then in five, in about five years, 5.2 years, we either want to have an exit where we sell it to Microsoft, Meta, one of these companies, or we take an IPO. So at that point, um, right now we're going through the seed, the pre-seed round, where we're selling, selling, selling shares of the company. Um, and anybody who comes in is probably going to 7x, 10x their investment. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm bringing more investors into it. I'm the, the chief investment officer, so I just bring people into it to invest. And most of the people that come into it are actual users or creators or somehow involved. And it, it's to their benefit because uh, they um, add value to uh, it. What's the amount that you're raising? Uh, for the, for the pre-seed round, we want to do a million. Yeah. And, and that you, you, you still have some, some available? Yeah, we still have some available. In fact, I was going to talk to you about investing in Ngozi. And then you already have a presence in social media. You can take that material and put it on the Ngozi platform. And then it just expands the brand even further. I mean, you already spoke at the uh, Long Beach event. And mm. I, you, you actually met Miklo there. Yeah. Yeah, that's where he met you. He told me. Um, and then other people. Oh, you, saw him, about you saw him today? Uh, no, 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 but we, we've been in touch, yeah, because mm -hmm. I, I want to work with him on the, the stuff he does. I think with he the was medicine. here earlier. Was he, was he here earlier? Last week, no? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like, I like Miklo. He's, he, I like his energy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, that's Ngozi, right? That's Ngozi, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm working on right now. Um, I also have Bloom Street, which I, I was inspired by you and Branson because I want to create, you know, a financial service piece, a real estate piece the legal, the law firm piece, because um, the idea is to bring in a client and take care of them comprehensively, right? Yeah, like yeah. A one-stop yeah. shop, which is similar to what you do, right, already. Yeah. And you're expanding your brand into different verticals yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, uh, that's, another, that's another thing that we're working on. And then my background is business management consulting, so I help business owners. So a lot of times I'm talking to business owners they are running into issues and I'm like, yeah, I know somebody who can help you with this, but I yeah. don't get the, I can get a bigger lion's share if I incorporate verticals into what I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's so awesome. So, so Frank, if yeah. anybody uh, watching this, if they want to reach out to you, they, they want to be part of Negosi, uh, they want to learn from you, uh, yeah. where can people follow you and reach out? Yeah. So you can follow me on LinkedIn, Frank Lopez. Or you can go on Instagram, my handle's in the back, Frank Funds Assets, and reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help have a conversation. If you could become an investor, a creator, participant. We also take corporate sponsorships for the Ngozi brand. And uh, it's been 3 xing We're only three years into the business, and every year it's been 3 xing And, I mean, from what you said, we have to accelerate our success so that Ngozi platform will be accelerated. Yeah. That's only one piece of the pie, right, of what we're doing. we got to put some gasoline to the fire. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Step on it. Yeah. Awesome, Frank. So I'll put all your information below. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Albert. 
I'm Albert Preciado. If you like what you're watching and you want to learn from an entrepreneur that built eight companies and makes over $30 million a year, text me at 213-277-6208 and let's make it happen.